Well, as we saw in the last game, entire opening systems uh, or variations can be based on the creation of uh, a strong pawn chain. As it happened in the last game, the pawn chain was completely smashed up. But uh, the next game proves something of a contrast and shows you just how strong uh, a connected pawn chain can be and can underpin the whole position. It's uh, a game from Linares, which was one of the finest tournaments in the world back in the 1990s. And it's between Alexander Beliavsky playing white and Alexander Kalifman playing black. This game comes uh, from 1995. At that time, these guys were two of the strongest players in the world. And the opening is a Benko Gambit, one of the most profound contributions to opening theory of the 20th century, whereby black gives up a pawn on the queen side in order to open lines. Well, we'll discuss, um, we'll discuss the gambit in a little more detail after a few more moves. But suffice it to say, white has accepted the gambit. These days, a lot of players tend to decline black's offer. And Believsky plays with e4, which is not everybody's cup of tea, because uh, it allows black to displace the white king. However, it was popular at that time. It's not a bad system for white. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to organise White's position, as you can imagine, because his first priority has got to be to get his king to a good square, and that costs a bit of time. So Beliavsky is going through with this idea of putting his king on g2, then he centralises his rook, black brings his queen out to a5, white plays h3, one idea in the Benko gambit is to exchange knights, so black will be thinking about the manoeuvre, Knight g4 to e5, therefore white takes that away. And now rook fb8. And now we have to discuss this uh, thematic position. So what compensation exactly does black have for a pawn? Well, as you can see, it's been very easy for him to develop his pieces. All his pieces have come out to good squares. Secondly, he is exerting very strong pressure down the a and b files towards the white pawns on a2 and b2 and that's one of the main themes of this opening the pawns there are very vulnerable to attacks from the black pieces thirdly black has a very safe king position tucked in there behind his pawns white's king also looks secure but it's not quite as secure as black's at this present time and finally, and this is one of the reasons a lot of players like the Benko Gambit so much, black has a fireproof pawn chain. It's very difficult to attack this pawn chain, and um, this is one of the reasons a lot of players play the Benko Gambit, because they understand that with this fireproof pawn chain, white attacks tend to go nowhere. So black likes his pawn chain in this position. For white, it's not so simple. Because as I pointed out, white has these targets on the A and B files for black to aim at. So all in all, um, a lot of players are very happy to play this position with black, even strong grandmasters, because white is forced onto the defensive. <clears throat> so Beliavsky, uh, for the time being, just goes through with the normal manoeuvre here. He secures his second rank by manoeuvring his rook to C2 and then putting the queen on E2. Black, meanwhile, manoeuvres his knights into good positions on the queen side. Black's idea, well, one idea, is certainly to play his knight to a4 in this position. The idea of exchanging the knights in the Benko Gambit is a very strong one for Black, because once that knight on c3, for instance, is out of the way, then the pawn at b2 becomes very exposed. So knight a4 is very much on Black's mind. He could play it immediately. He prefers queen a6. And this is another very profound idea, because normally you would not think about exchanging the queens when you're a pawn down. But in the Benko Gambit, it's active pieces and pressure down the queen side files that matters. Um, with the queens off, it's less easy for white to mount any sort of attack. So um, black is playing very thematically in this position. And white, for his part, just defends that knight. So white is still defending here. Black brings his knight to c7, and that knight could be heading for b5, accelerating the pressure on b2. White plays a3. Not really a move he wants to make, because it creates a nasty hole there on b3. But uh, obviously Beliavsky felt it was forced due to Black's coming pressure. f5. 
Um, very interesting because black is now attacking the white chain, the white pawn chain on two fronts. He's attacking on the queen side, as we can see. And with the white pieces all tied down, it's time now to open up a second front by attacking the white pawn chain in the center. Beliavsky defends. Khalifman chops on e4. And now he chops on c3. White recaptures with the knight. Well, taking back with the pawn is possible. But uh, that allows, I think, this very strong move, rook b3, with perhaps knight b5 to come. White is all tied up in this position. And uh, it's very difficult for him to lift black's bind. So going back, knight takes c3 was played. Black played knight b5. It's amazing, a pawn down. Black just starts swapping off the pieces. But now what's left on the board? Three active black pieces against three passive white pieces. Very thematic. And Beliavsky decides to give back a pawn here to try and lift the pressure. So bishop takes b2. Rook b1. Rook a b6. Pawn up to a4. This is white's only trump. And it's true in a lot of Benko Gambit positions. Is this pawn strong or weak? White is trying to prove that that is a strong pass pawn. Black, for his part, thinks that his active pieces are going to carry the day. A5, pushing forward. Bishop takes C1. A nice little intermezzo. So that if A takes B6 here, a serious mistake, we have Rook takes B1. Uh, so, White recaptured with his Rook on, uh, on B1. Black gave a check and put his Rook on B5. So everything's going to hinge here. Is that pawn strong or weak? Well, let us see. Califman encourages the pawn forward. And now really, actually, this pawn is, is impossible to defend. Because if, if, if white takes on b2 here, we just give a check and then put our rook in behind the passed pawn. And as you can see, far from being a pawn down now, black is going to end up a pawn up. And with his pawn chain still together... It's going to be very difficult for White to hold this position, if it indeed it is at all possible. So White moves forward with e5. Black takes. Takes on a6. White takes on d6. And now we enter the realm of a rook end game, where virtually White's only chance now is to put the rook on e6 and hope that he can tie Black down. But it is a forlorn hope, as with the disappearance of White's queenside pawns, Black has now got... Uh, Again, a very thematic idea in the Benko Gambit. A passed C pawn on C5. Nicely protected, ready to move forward at a moment's notice to cause white hassle. White's got to look after the pawn. Black moves in. White brings his king up. There's a check. The king comes back. Well, I'm sure white would have preferred to have made the move king f2 in this position but then black's got a nice choice between rook d3 or just rook a2 either way this is not nice for white king e2 is answered by rook a2 and king e3 by king f6 the spectre of the black king appearing on e5 is very real king d2 was answered by rook a3 black is trading advantages in this rook end game he's giving up his c pawn to run riot on the king side Rook e4 at least stops king e5. Black chops another pawn off. White moves in, takes his only chance chopping the pawn off. But unfortunately here, black's king is nearby. And there are two passed pawns now. How ironic black wins this game on the king side. Rook a6 was answered by rook h5. And now it is, unfortunately for, for, for white, completely lost. As he gives up his d-pawn, in order to win the h pawn, but the problem is the white king is cut off by at least three files from the pawn on g6, and this makes it an easy win. So the rest of the game is easy to understand. Um, white is forced passive in order to look after the black pawn. Ultimately, he cannot save the game because his own king is cut off. So rook a5 and Beliavsky resigned. There are some notes here. Let's just take a look at it. If king d3, we go g4. It's very easy to win this position. The pawn advances inexorably. 
White's King is not on time here to stop the pawn. We now have what is called the Lucina position. Well, we don't even get that. Now, the thing is that Black won this game because White was unable to create counterplay. If we go back to the position, let's say, after A3, what we've got here is an extra pawn for White, but completely passive pieces. Black's pawn chain keeps White out. There's no point of attack. I mean, the only point of attacking Black's pawn chain is the pawn at E7, virtually impossible to get at, and Black's active pieces carry the day. So you could see, you could say actually that Black's pawn chain set the scene, set the tone for the whole game. 